you've had a few controversies online. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the Lydia Millen has been blogging for over a decade. Lydia's story is full of twists and turns. She has often stayed quiet on this and very, very rarely does interviews. My palms are really sweaty. One of the things that I think I've struggled the most with communicating online is my childhood. What were you like back then? I've heard that you spent summers in Ibiza. I had a job at Ibiza Rocks, Plastic, Eden. I would go from one job to the other and then I'd go out and I'd party. Where do you think that desire or enjoyment of earning money came from? For me, it all links back to... I learned really early on that I couldn't depend on a lot of people. How do you deal with the criticism? I've been on the receiving end of cancel culture. See, I've lost count of how many times I've experienced it. I'm not about to feel sorry for myself. Do you think you have like an online persona? It's such a hard one, isn't it? Failing in the way that I did, I didn't know how to cope with it at the time and it floored me. I didn't know enough. That's the long and short that I have never felt shame like that. If you could do it all again, would you be an influencer? I think that what is up guys and welcome back to working hard hardly working podcast today we have Lydia Millen on the podcast with a combined following of over three million on social media platforms Lydia has been blogging for over a decade Lydia began her journey in 2011 documenting her outfits as a student Lydia's story is full of twists and turns she's gone from achieving three GCSEs at school to moving out of her parents house and now building a life she says she's always dreamt of after a crucial repositioning towards kind of high luxury content this expanded into huge online success for her blog YouTube and social media content which she shares with her followers online through her kind of opulent videos Lydia has reflected on her past in her new book Evergreen published in October. Now look, it is no secret that Lydia has been involved in kind of public controversies in her years online. Lydia has often stayed quiet on this and very, very rarely does interviews. So I'm very excited to be able to talk to her about this and her whole career and kind of her whole life online today. I consider that a huge privilege for her to feel comfortable enough to be in this space, um, to talk to her about it. And having done this interview, she really opens up on kind of what's that, what that's felt like, but also what she feels like she's done kind of wrong or not got right in those times and how that's developed her as a person and as a creator and where she thinks she can be better but also we as a kind of culture can have a better culture towards reacting proportionately to issues on social media. I really wanted to see a little bit behind the curtain into the Lydia Millen, her life, what it's like behind this online persona, whether she feels like she has an online persona. And I'm hugely grateful to her for allowing me to kind of dive into that a little bit more. So I hope you really enjoy this episode. As always, if you do enjoy it, please make sure to like, subscribe, rate, review, send it to a friend. But thank you so much. And I hope you really enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed recording it. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm very excited. I feel like we have a lot to talk about and I am very grateful for you coming on here. Um, you're one of those guests that when we're doing the research, usually there's like lots of podcasts. There's lots like out and I am so grateful for you wanting to come on this podcast and to talk to me. Well, I don't think that there is anybody else that I would want to do this with in all honesty. Like I watched your, your videos of the podcast. They always come up on my TikTok and I just think... I feel very, very lucky to follow in some very, very big footsteps to be here today. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, I'm going to get straight into it. Um, I always ask guests about their kind of early life, their childhood, generally because I feel like it's very important in who we turn into today. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what your childhood was like. Okay. Um, and this is, I think this is one of the things that I think I've struggled the most with with communicating online is my my childhood because my parents were together for five years and when they split it was almost like two worlds happened so my mum moved into a rented council house and my dad moved into a really luxurious man pad in Northwood it was only in the last few months I would say of the year that I realized that that's actually really confusing for me because I'd explain to people, oh yeah, so I lived here. No, well, I also kind of lived here. And I also, yeah, we went to our holiday home here and 
but mum didn't have that holiday home. So it was just, it was a strange one. And I think it's, um, it's definitely been interesting understanding that I kind of felt like I had a really lovely experience in those first five years. And then it got really confusing and I've just never really been able to communicate it in a way that even makes sense to me. Right, and I think it, also if it doesn't make sense to you, then it's very hard to communicate your kind of feelings about it and how it cemented your kind of understanding of the world. Because mm. I always think that like when I talk to guests about how their understanding of the world was formed and how their understanding of kind of where they stand in that world, mm -hmm. like even as you were saying, like did we have a lot of money or were we stretched or yeah. were we kind of actually incredibly privileged or whatever it might be. And your understanding of the world is I mean, most of the time it's developed by what your parents were like and the environment you grew up in. Mm. I can imagine growing up in two very different environments mm. would have also created two very different sides of you in a kind of understanding of what it's like in either one. Mm. How did that form your kind of aspirations? I would say that I sort of, the way that I, I navigated it was I kind of, started romanticizing my life in whatever iteration it was in at the time. And I think that's something that has really stayed with me th throughout my entire life from, you know, buying my first home or where, where I was there in my first career to now is that I was like, I kind of don't know where I am here. I don't know where I am here. So I'm just gonna make the best of what's here and always make the best of it, no matter what situation it is. And it's meant that I've had like I've always felt really content. Mm. And then when life gets better and I, I aspire to something new and I move into that stage of my life, I find contentment there. And I'm like, this is nice. This is this is more than I ever expected. But, you know, I remember when I bought my first home and it was a, um, even just that, buying my first home, I never imagined that. My mum's house was bought for her by my dad and I never imagined I'd be in that position. And so I really sort of romanticized this house that was like an ex council house where my wardrobe in there, I used to call it my walk-in wardrobe, I could stand in it. It wasn't a walk-in wardrobe, but it was, that was my next step. That was what I was aspiring to. So I was creating that happy place there in the house in the situation that I was in because I kind of had to navigate understanding where I was at that time and the limitations of where I was at that time. And then hopefully aim for the next stop. And am I right in thinking you moved in with your grandmother? Yes. Yeah, I did. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Well, yes. Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, so I had a boyfriend whilst I was at university. And when I finished university, I um, moved back to where I grew up. And I moved in with him and his family because I was straight fresh out of university. I had nowhere, nowhere to go. And... Uh, I had a quite a strained relationship with my mum in the early days. I think that's kind of a girl thing, but I think I held a lot of animosity to her then, which I don't hold now. And so I couldn't really go back to live with her. But then when we broke up, I moved in with her. It really wasn't great. And I was sort of at this point where I was like, I don't know where to go. I've got my job here. I, I Where do I go? My dad lives miles away. I've got nowhere. And my grandma took me in and I think that that was the moment where I really like, that was where I got focused because she's such an incredible woman, like the most formidable woman I have ever met. And she just took me in, gave me my bedroom, gave me structure. She would listen to how I was finding my new career. And I talked to her about my blog as I'd started it and she was very supportive, which wasn't something that maybe I'd always got from my mum. And so I had this, this experience of like the mum that I hadn't had. And it was a really sort of formative few years for me. I think I was there for two years is where I met Ali, my husband. And um, yeah, that was special. Probably like I look, I look back on those days and I'm like, wow. And can you tell me a little bit about when you, you talk about being at university and kind of graduating and what that was like, mm. what were you like back then? I know I've heard that you spent summers in Ibiza. You've <laughs> talked about like the difference between you then and now. I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of like what was Lydia like then? <laughs> Ibiza was so funny for me because I think that there's this like misconception about why people go there for their summers. 
and I want to say that it was like, you know, this wild time. And it probably, was, if I was to write a book about it, it would be quite wild. But I was working three or four jobs when I was there. And I was there to work because I loved it. I loved the environment. I was like a Duracell bunny. I just, I'd work throughout the day. I, I had a job at Ibiza Rocks, plastic, um, Eden, loads of different places and I would go from one job to the other and then I'd go out and I'd party and then I'd get up the next day go to the beach for a little bit go to work go to the next job and just do it do it like that all the time because I knew I wanted to have fun but fun to me wasn't me I, I liked making money and I've always liked making money and so that was a really that was a way of me doing two things I felt independent I felt comfortable I was earning enough money for me to be able to go and buy myself like a nice perfume. I wasn't, you know, living in a in a flat that wasn't a nice flat when I was there. And I lived a really good life when I was there. Um, so I was able to enjoy myself, have a summer and I'd go home with money in my pocket and I'd go to university and I'd be able to then do my two jobs at university. So it kind of, rather than going traveling, it seemed like a really good option for me. And I, I think that's where I learned how much I, enjoyed making money mm -hmm. and I enjoyed that that was something that gave me a lot of purpose it it gave me a lot of focus and it made me realize that it was one of the jobs that I did I, I worked solely on commission I'd never done that before you know I'd worked in some fairly normal teenage jobs growing up but this was the first time I'd, I'd like it was my responsibility for me to get paid and that was probably the most money I'd ever made in my life and I was like, oh, wow, what an experience. Okay, so it's not scary as long as I put in the work. Interesting. And so from there, it was sort of like a, it went on to affect my time at university because at university, again, I worked two or three jobs when I was there. Even though I liked to go out, I liked to do the student stuff. That wasn't why I was there. I was slightly older as well. I was 21 when I went to, to uni. So. I was working in a bar, I was working at Topshop because I still wanted to live a nice life and, and enjoy it. And where do you think that desire or enjoyment of earning money kind of came from? What was it that it gave you that you think motivated you, I guess, more than other things or more than maybe, I, I don't want to put words in yourself, but your mouth and kind of say more than the regular person, but it sounds like you have this recognition that actually you did really like making money and mm. you would go further to make sure you made more and compromise other things. 110% for me, it all links back to, I feel like I learned really early on that I couldn't depend on a lot of people. And so if I had enough money for me to do things, if I had all of my ducks in a row, I didn't have to depend on anyone. And I remember it took me a few years to pass my um, driving test. And so I used to depend on someone like my mom or, or whoever to drive me around. And that just having that where someone could hold something over me, I think that's where it came from that I, I wanted to not have to depend on anyone, anyone. And I think that that's something that my husband has had to learn to really understand because it, when I'm in any kind of situation where I feel sort of vulnerable, I very much close down and I just focus on, on sort of like my, um, self-preservation whereas I think most people look outwards and, and look for support I'm not like that so let's talk about the beginning of your online presence mm. how did that come about it's a it's a, a, a story that I feel like I've told a hundred times it's every time I tell this story I feel like it changes a little bit because I think that you you understand why you made certain decisions early on to and you sort of understand more about yourself and but I think for me, it was a frust it came from frustration because I was at university and I really wanted to be working in fashion and fashion at the time was like the girl's career goal. That's what you wanted to, to do. And I wanted to be a fashion buyer and I couldn't, I couldn't get on the course. So I was frustrated. I was, I was studying something that was very, very helpful, but it wasn't what it, it wasn't keeping me inspired. Mm -hmm. And I had always had websites. I don't know if you re remember homestead it was like homestead where you you just i taught myself to code and i built websites and i would just write oh, incredible on them. 
re before blogging. This is like when I was 16. And so I knew what I was doing. And I, I, I saw that some, I think it was like the, the age of um, Lily Melrose and those kind of girls. And I was seeing what they were doing. I was like, right, okay, I can do that. I can take pictures of my clothes on the, on the floor, not even thinking to actually wear the clothes. I just like put a jumper on the floor, like really like this jumper and then write about it. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, wait, maybe I should wear the clothes. That's great. And, um, and then there was lookbook.new, which was kind of like Facebook for, for fashion. And I started posting on there and I saw quite a, a big sort of uptake on that. And it just kind of went from there. And then I, was, I realized I was working at this on the weekends. I wasn't being paid then, but I loved it and I enjoyed it so much that I kept sort of going at it and going at it. And I probably worked in it for like four years before I ever got paid, which is fascinating to see how far it's come now. Like the industry is just so different. But what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> me I've with literally it. everything. Um, how your online persona started, oh, which yeah. you've actually answered okay, okay. incredibly well. Um, and <laughs> so how did it go from there into, I mean, whistle stop tour, but kind of how did it go from there into kind of what we see today? That is a very, very good question because I I think a part of it has to play with being there at the right time, 100%. But I do also think that in this industry, there is something about certain people that people find them online and they, they like them. And so my audience kept growing. Even when I pivoted and changed, my audience kept growing. And it's always for the 10 years, no, 11, 12, 10, however many years, um, I've been doing this, it still grows today, which doesn't happen often. So I do think that it was just sort of like a, a natural progression, but I worked hard at it. I was, I'm lucky that I come from a family of many entrepreneurs. My brother ha has done amazing things and I always have a nod to this. What he said to me was, if you're not working until 2 a.m. Lydia, you're not working hard enough on your business. And so I was like, right, I take that, that very seriously. So before I was doing YouTube, I would be writing my blog posts and I'd pour my heart and soul into those blog posts. And I'd be falling asleep at my laptop at 2 a.m. and just constantly working at it. I'd have an idea for a video, I'd film it there and then. And I was constantly trying to be at the forefront, the most content back when the algorithm really kind of um, championed mass content rather than uh, what is it now? Like trending content. It's right. kind of different. Um, but yeah, so I, I just worked really, really hard. And then the job started coming in and I thought, wow, okay. I remember turning to, to my husband one day and saying like, this is a really unique position we're in because we get to invest our time and see if it pays off in a monetary way. We don't have to invest huge amounts of money in this. And I really didn't in the beginning. It was only when I had my first big pay packet that I took that money instantly and I invested it in a Canon 5D Mark something, Canon 5D. And it was like, that was like the camera to have. I remember, the yeah, I yeah. remember the times. And it was like thousands. That was like, I think it, yeah, that camera was actually the same amount of money that I put down on my first mortgage. Cause I was really lucky that they did 5% mortgages when I got mm. my first home. But that camera was the same amount that I put down. So that was huge for me. And that was the first investment I ever made in it. And it paid off. And then I was filming videos on, on, on that camera and it really elevated my content. And I think that's the thing you have to sort of catch the eye of brands and, and businesses. And, and they, they want to think, well, oh, she's doing something good there. Mm. I want to be a part of that. She speaks really well about, about our product or she speaks really well about that product. So maybe she'd like ours. And the next thing I know, I'm sat with some of the biggest beauty brands in the world having breakfast at Claridge's. And I was like, I'd never been. I was like, this is amazing. And so, yeah, it was a, it was definitely a, a it, now that I look back, it feels like it was like a skyrocket. But in reality, I, like I said, I've been doing this for so many years that it feels like a natural progression as well. So weird. And your content is luxury focused. What was your decision behind choosing luxury? I think that goes back to what I was saying in the beginning is that, and I have this belief that, and I'm, I don't know if you believe the same thing or if anyone listening is, 
believe in the same thing, but luxury is really subjective. And so I thought that my first house was really luxurious. We painted the whole thing white. We had really lovely furniture in there that, you know, I managed to get a, a good price or whatever. And so really I was just talking about the lovely things in my life and, and sharing what I thought was lovely. That's obviously progressed as my career has progressed. But those moments of luxury is something that I didn't realize that I was doing quite naturally and, and making often quite mundane aspects of life, like, you know, doing your hair. There's a way to make that a really wonderful experience. And cooking dinner, I always say, whenever I cook a meal for my husband and I, I'm like, I get to cook this meal. And so for me, it's always been just about highlighting those elements of life. Sometimes, and very much in my early days, that did focus around the handbags, the shoes, the cars. And whilst that's still an element, 100%, I can't deny that, I've learned that there are so much more. And I talk about that in my book, and it's, it, it's very much a balance. I find a lot of purpose in working, earning money. That's, that's a lot of purpose. But I may not find my happiness there or with the money that comes from that or the, the things that come from that. I may not find my happiness, but my purpose is there. My happiness comes from the other things. And so it was just generally sh sharing that, that those were the things that I enjoyed talking about. The, so that's what I did. It wasn't really, I don't, I feel like we didn't really think about it as much as we think about it now. As like, you know, what's your content strategy? There wasn't really a content strategy back then. It was just, this is what I like. This is what I'm interested in. And at the time, especially on YouTube, nobody was talking about the handbags because it was still that very young market, kind of what we see on TikTok now, whereas TikTok is now in that, that progression that YouTube went through. Everything starts off with the younger generation. And that's what I always do. It's like, if the kids are talking about it, I've got to be there. <laughs> but that was what I did on, on YouTube. I was like, I, I kind of know that I want to watch this stuff. I want to know what's, you know, a nice handbag to have. I want to know where to shop for X, Y, Z. And I don't want to watch the gunging videos or anything. Like that. They have definitely had their place and I have definitely howled. <laughs> Lydia Millen doesn't like slime? Well, I did one of those videos, okay. And I think it's still out when Ali and I custard cream pied each other. Have Please you ever done bring back the content. <laughs> Can you imagine? Again now. <laughs> but I, the, the cream went into our eyes and I was going out that night. The cream went into our eyes and I don't even know how, but it like rotted. <laughs> so all I could taste was rotting cream for like three days. I was like, I'm never doing that again. That is not luxury. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> that is not the position. Yeah, right? no. But, so I think that that was, I, I acknowledge that if I'm wanting to watch this type of content, if I want to, to see people talk about this, and I was very, very much at the forefront of that. And I saw in a month, I gained 50,000 followers, which at the time was very quick. Nowadays, we see numbers much bigger than that, but at the time that was very quick. And the appetite was there, so I talked about it more. And I do think that that's very much m what my audience enjoy. They, they like to, to hear about the nice things, some of them as an escape, others because genuinely they're looking to buy something. Um, there's always a side of the audience that maybe it's not it's not right for them and I understand that um I try to to do balance I don't always do it very well but I try right but in any other walk of I don't know even like publications it's made to be specific for a target audience yeah. um and that is how you find your thing um and I think you are serving the luxury sphere very well and it's quite clear what it says on the tin I have an interesting question for you as part of that. You've spoken openly about the difference between you in kind of your summers in Ibiza and you now. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people would be more comfortable if you had continued, essentially if it was like similar to how you positioned yourself then? I'm really interested in the difference in like, cause I've had so many iterations online mm -hmm. and I often feel like some of the times I've had most I felt most like I'm treading a careful line is because I've changed. Mm -hmm. And that's been a good thing for me, but actually it is different and therefore it is a bit uncomfortable. 
That is such a good question. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and I, w- I would say that first of all, the fact that you've had so many iterations, you know, I, I love that because I love to see someone evolve. I, I love seeing someone's transformation and someone's wins and successes. So you doing that, I honestly, I'm grateful that you share that online. For me, I definitely noticed that things changed when I moved to my house that I'm currently in. So whether it was the me in Ibiza or whether it was the me in my old house, I think it was, I was more, um, it was better received me talking about the expensive handbags and things like that. It was better received when I was in my old house. I think when we moved house, it was, it was very, it got quite intense for a while. Um, but I understand, I, I do understand as well. So it is, whereas I think I'm just sharing the natural progressions of life, sometimes that can be stifling for other people when I get that. And, and what age were you when you started posting online? I was older. I was older. I was like, I think I began when I was 20, 23 or 24. Right. But the difference between in that, did you say it was 11 years? I have kind of lost count. <laughs> but the difference in that time, I mean, you'd hope someone would change. And I, what I've always yeah. said is that actually my where I found that you know as you said that it was definitely quite intense for a while Mm. where I found it most intense online has been through my iterations of change but obviously I mean I started at 18 and kind of between those I then went to university and then I then started businesses I'm still to a lot of people uni grace which is so fair enough because actually that's when I was putting out most content I probably put out more content in a week than I do in a year now so like as in there's obviously understandably going to be a association with that I am quite fascinated though by the uncomfortableness online of change whilst also hoping people will grow up and hoping people will do better and hoping people will kind of improve I've always been quite fascinated by it because I was so resistant to change for a while or I was kind of so I think that actually when I was at university people liked my content the most because it was pretty consistent for three years Mm -hmm. like it was three years of me living in one room and writing essays and talking about it and as much as I look back and I'm like why did anyone watch that that's so (laughs) boring I also think that actually that was quite consistent and you could get used to that and that was quite comfortable Mm -hmm. and there and that's probably why for a while afterwards I was so, I mean, I was terrified about sharing content the second I graduated because I just knew that I was going to be one of those influencers who moved to London and then just was doing that as a full-time job. And Mm. that was terrifying to me. Mm. But I do think we have this kind of resistance. We we demand change and evolution, but we also have this resistance to it because it's Mm. different from your original positioning. Yeah, I think that that's such a good point. Like, I think that it's not easy to want to to watch somebody change Mm. and then also maybe feel like they're at a different stage in your life like the frustrations that come from that I can only imagine right whether better whether like perceived as better or worse or further along or less far along like I've had you know I've had creators that I've loved or loved at university and then you know they got engaged and then they started families and I actually was kind of like you're not disappointed, but you're kind of like, oh, I, I really related to that content. Yeah. And now I, I actually can't find that replacement elsewhere because it's actually probably one of the only industries where direct replacement is really quite tough. Mm. Like yeah. that, you know, I still, yeah, I, I know that lots of people still now preferred my uni content, which is absolutely <laughs> fine because I don't consider myself a content creator first now. Mm. But I think it's so interesting because it's the walking a line of making sure you're evolving in your career and also your personality and who you are and sharing that whilst also thanking people and appreciating that they were there at a very different time. Mm. And that's going to be, I mean, at the very least annoying, but something you liked changed. Yeah, I, I, I think that one of the unique things about the industry is that a lot of the time your audience is very passionate Mm. and I am so grateful for that and like part of me I often make you know I feel like oh god I wish I could have stayed that person that you took so much joy in but I can't I like I'm I am somebody who really loves evolution and 
every day I like I learn something new and even just you know the, in recent years I feel like the whole world has gone through such a huge transformation recently and I have changed the most since we went into lockdown that was my my biggest shift right and I knew that that was going to be uncomfortable but it is like growth is uncomfortable we know the cliche sayings like growth is uncomfortable and comfort zones nothing grows there so we can all stay in them if we want to but that's not that's not the person I am and I'd like to think that some people will take the good from showing the evolution as well just like I take the good from your evolution I'm so grateful that you share the things that you do now online and that you're not still doing your uni content as <laughs> lovely as it was um I'm, I'm really grateful because you you do so much for women in business like genuinely hand on heart the, the stuff that you've been sharing recently just I know congratulations on your very big day with um was it a million pounds in an hour? It was. That's on like, but I hope you realize that you talking about that is going to be creating a space for women where they can talk about that. Because I know I've never felt able to talk about my monetary wins. And when I've, I, I've never felt comfortable. So the fact that you're doing that means that there are gonna be women in future that feel comfortable to show up with that kind of energy. So genuinely that is, I've gone off on a tangent again, but I just, no, I feel like you. I needed to fangirl for that. Because <laughs> no, it is, I really it's, appreciate it's important. That. And, and that, this side of, of you now, I'm so grateful for, because you make me feel comfortable in just even acknowledging so many things in my business that usually I'd be like, you know, we used to be so scared that people would find out how much I charged. Mm. Like I, I lived in fear that we were gonna get an email from someone posing as a brand and that people were gonna find out how much I charged. I don't wanna live like that. And so when you do things like that, you really are helping so many people to be more comfortable with things. I feel more Thank comfortable. Thank you. Thanks. I literally knew the second I shared it, I was like, this is going to come back to bite me. <laughs> the reality is, is that when you're having an amazing, this is what I always describe it as, when you're having an amazing time in the sort of public eye, it gets hot. Lots of eyes are on you and lots of, lots of opinions and you see them come out, but that's why you are where you are because you've been able to get comfortable with knowing that it gets hot then. Mm. It really does. And it's the same with, you know, the last month that I've had where I've launched my book and I knew, and we all talked about it. We, I knew that it was going to get hotter. I was looking that way and it sideswiped me the other way, but it was, it got hot. But I've had to learn over the years how to get comfortable in those situations and have processes in place. I don't know if you have like processes in place for how you deal with it or whether you're just like, nah, got it. <laughs> I'm not like, nah, got it, but I definitely don't have processes in, is in place just generally because I actually don't share that much content. Yeah. So I actually, yeah, I, I as in I kind of, I don't expect it, but I also do expect it, but mm. I also don't think I can really prepare for it. No. So I generally kind of, you know, roll with the punches. I know what I feel like I did right, what I feel like I did wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that being in a more, you know, I want to, as a woman, show business success, but I know, and I'm, I'm the one who's talking about that success and gets that success. So that's a, you know, that's, I can't complain about the position I'm in. I do know that the negative of that is going to be the fact that it makes people very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. whether for justifiable reasons or not, I know it will. I know that it wouldn't make people anywhere near as uncomfortable if I was a man posting about that million an hour. Um, and I know that no one would think that was going into my pocket, a man posting about their business doing that, um, which it's certainly not. Um, even if it was, I would still have a right to post about it. But I do think that that's kind of the reality. And if you're wanting to challenge things and you're wanting to be known as someone who did some things first, you're also going to be pushing some uncomfortable buttons and you have to get comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I don't know, I, I like to not try and think that I'm always getting it right. In fact, I very publicly get things wrong sometimes. Um, and can I just say I'm grateful for that too. Thank you. <laughs> like genuinely though, like the, it's about, getting comfortable like mm. with humans because this whole world this whole digital world that we're experiencing now where people can follow us along with things is born because we wanted that human to human connection more we'd had the celebrity endorsements for so long and they were just untouchable airbrushed images on on magazines and adverts and the reason why this has happened and this the birth of the internet has been, you know, social media in this way has happened is because we wanted human. We wanted more of that. So we wanted the messiness, but we're sort of in a funny 
stage now where we kind of want the the human but we don't want the mistakes and i think that the more we share the mistakes and the failures and i think that's something that's that is happening more we a lot of people are talking about this more whereas before you didn't want to talk about where you maybe got it wrong or you know failed at something now we talk about it and mm. openly and again these things make some people uncomfortable but i i think that you've got to be the the person that stands up and says i'm i'm going to be part of the change and as they say first over the wall gets the bloodiest and that's what you're experiencing now i think that's a saying or i might have just paired two different sayings together <laughs> to make it kind of makes sense yeah <laughs> um no i completely appreciate that and i do i do think that's very right and i think that you know, as you've said, it's about getting comfortable with that being the yeah. case. And I don't think that you, you don't get the benefits of having, being in this position without the shit. Absolutely. In the nicest way possible. Um, I know you speak in the book about kind of what people see on the outside is quite different from what there is on the inside. Could you talk a little bit more about that and kind of whether you feel like you have, do you feel like you have an online persona? I, I feel, I almost feel like my online persona has almost been taken out of my hands. Like that, that narrative has almost been taken out of my hands to a certain extent. And I would say that I've definitely, in recent years, there's more of me now. Like on my YouTube channel, I'm, I'm much more candid and I show very much the, the, my sense of humor a bit more um there I, I i definitely struggle on different platforms like mm -hmm. i'm not one of those people that like turns it on and they're like blah, 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 blah. i'm not i'm not like that i'm i'm like unexpectedly funny when i do things <laughs> it just comes out no i can't i can't it doesn't translate well quickly in on other platforms i would say and so i would say that naturally on some platforms i may be perceived as almost like being like a perfectionist and I don't know, perhaps, I don't really know how to say it, but perceived differently. But if the if someone wanted context around me, they could definitely go and, and, and find it. I'm much better at, at sharing who I am and what I'm about and the things that, that really matter to, to me on my YouTube channel. That's where, you know, my videos are an hour long. You can get, acquainted with me I think that now I need to bring more of myself to, to other platforms and I think that that's where there's maybe a different perception of me which I, I am sad that that would be because I think that I'm there's a lot of good that I do and I work hard and I'm doing doing my best and I think that I'm quite open with a lot of things that that happen in life and I share a lot and I'm quite a vulnerable person I don't know how to be guarded online I don't know if you're good at that I'm not good at that but it's yeah it, that's the thing that I, I think I, I struggle with because I'm like oh no that's definitely not what I'm about it's also just not it's just not who I am at all so that's difficult and we're kind of used to or definitely how I see you most online I mean I see I, I follow you on YouTube as well um and I see your Instagram posts the the on TikTok everything looks so beautiful really? and it's yeah and it's so pristine I'd love to know what does your daily routine actually look like like what's the I kind of want you to make me feel better here um, about my personal you know the aesthetic of my personal daily routine but I'd love to know like what it actually looks like First of all, I think that's so funny that you say that because TikTok just honestly feels like I'm, I feel like someone's mum like operating on TikTok because I don't edit on the app. I, I film it on a camera and then I edit it, on, edit it on my computer and then I upload. I don't know how the app works and I've got 1.1 million followers on there and I don't know how the app works. So I'm, I'm really just winging it there at the moment. But <laughs> when it comes to my routine, it's, I, I think that I, I struggle a lot with routine because my job is so here, there and every, everywhere. One day I'll be in another country. One day I'll be in bed, you know, getting a lay in. And so I have to have structure because otherwise I don't get anything done. I get quite confused if 
one of the things I've learned about myself recently is that if somebody puts something in my diary in the middle of the day and there's nothing else before then, I don't know what happens to me, but I can't move. I can't do anything until that, because I'm so scared I'm gonna miss it, that I just sit there and I'm like, I could do this, I've got an hour, but I don't wanna start doing that. So I've had to really get quite good at having a succession of things before I undertake anything in the day so that there's, right, okay, this is what's gonna happen here, then I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna get to that. So I do have to have a lot of routine and I'd, I'd, I'd want to, to give you the comfort that maybe I don't have. Sometimes I, I'm, I don't have a routine, but for the most part I have to, otherwise I don't get anything mm. done. And I know you share your routines quite a lot. You share your- um... I operate like a child at school. Yeah. I must have a timetable yeah. at all times. Um, and that is the only way I operate. Yeah, I have to, I, I know that about myself now, that if I don't just even physically write it down, that's, I can't type it on a phone. I have to physically write it in my diary. And even Ali found one of my old diaries the other day and he brought it into the, and he'd like read it out. And I'd literally like scheduled when I was gonna have a coffee because I needed to break it down into that so that I could get things done. And that's how I work best. And I do struggle with not having a routine and not having the ability to have um, structure in the normal way. Like I would love to have like every day where I get up at like five, 6 a.m., work out, take the dogs for a walk, get ready for work, have to get ready for work. I can't, I'm, I'm not someone that can work in my pajamas. I have to get ready, makeup, hair, full outfit but then I'll have an event that evening and I might not get home until three in the morning. And then I, the next day I can't get up until 10 o'clock. And that's my whole routine that gives me my most effective, most productive days, I, that's all gone. And so I do, I have to always on a Monday be quite strict with myself. I have my PT session always like scheduled in on a Monday so that I kick off my working week in the exact same way as much as possible but yeah routine is is a, is a big one but I think we hear that quite a lot I think that it depends whether you're an evening person or a morning person but having a, a set routine really helps but I, I will operate in a world where that you can't it's not like a I start work at nine and I finish at five there are no lines within my job like that. Right, yeah, and actually when I got really burnt out, it was often because I stopped seeing certain things at work if they were after a certain time, but reality is in an industry where some of the things are in the evening mm. and they do go on quite late. Mm. And I wasn't counting that as work at all, I was counting that as an evening plans and that yeah. would be exactly where I kind of, yeah, yeah went too far. Yeah. Um, you've spoken about the need for council culture versus cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to me about that a little? Well, I think we touched on this before and how a lot of the time our response nowadays is disproportionate to the issue at hand. Um, the situation, I know I found myself in a number of situations where I've been on the receiving end of cancel culture. I honestly, I've lost count of how many times I've experienced it. And I've had to I've really studied this as like a, I've had to understand the, the human response, the, the difference between, you know, being offended and harm and, and that kind of thing. And I've really wanted to look at this and under, understand it. And a lot of the time we're approaching situations that should be done through conversation, education, in the way that you would sit down with a friend if they said something or did something or made a mistake, you talk to them about it and you'd hope that they were able to hear you out and have a conversation. And instead it becomes a very, very destructive environment online over things that, you know, most of the time, and, and absolutely we need to hold people accountable mm. for things when they're like you know, crimes, you know, there are some really, really terrible things and I don't, and that's not what I'm talking about here. Mm. Like those are, are, are very, very different the general day-to-day -day of, of life that we talked about, like um, making mistakes, failures, you know, saying, saying silly things, it's in those moments where discussion, time, reflection is really where the council culture side of things rather than council culture is needed because it's, it's just like when you're parenting a child 
we've learned over the years that shouting at a child doesn't really help them much. Doesn't really get the message across any, any quicker. Actually educating them through, learning with them and speaking to them, having the conversation and giving them the time and the reflection on it. That's where children flourish. And I don't know why we, we can't apply the same level to each other but I do think it's just a culture that we're in at the moment and I think that that will change, but it's got quite disproportionate to a lot of the things at, at hand. And whilst I understand that there will always be people that are, are hurt by things and that's important to acknowledge, but I, I, I really like to, to think that we could talk about things a little bit more. And as you say, you've had a few controversies online. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I have not a clue. <laughs> I'm afraid to. Uh, you Sorry, you got the wrong girl. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> Those days where that's happened, mm -hmm. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, because I can imagine it happens and you can probably see it, see it boiling up mm -hmm. and you can probably see something and you wonder whether that's going to be one that's going to go or mm -hmm. whether it's not. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to me a little bit about what that type of day is like or like the feeling or what you notice or any kind of similarities mm -hmm. or is every single like is everyone kind of different first and foremost i think what's important that i say is that i never mean any harm to anyone and i think that that's like something that i always want to like underline is that that's I'm, my content is very vanilla. I'm so glad that you talked about like the whole of it, but like it's very vanilla. A lot of the time it's me, my dogs, my cat, my husband, me going to collect the, the, the eggs from the hens, me gardening. I might show you a few nice things. It's very, very vanilla. It's not a space where I set out to ever offend anyone. In fact, I want people to feel a little bit like, you know, I expect them to sit there with a blanket and a cup of tea and watch my, my video. That's what I've how I envision it in my head. Um, so that's, I think, really important for me to say because I, I never ever want to offend anyone with what I, what I say. And that really hurts me whenever that, that happens because my Achilles heel is people not thinking I'm a nice person. And I've been very candid with that. Tough job to be in. <laughs> oh yeah. And I was really vulnerable about this in the beginning. I was like, yeah, like I really, I struggle with people not thinking I'm a good person. And I think that that's potentially why a lot of the things that have happened have centered around me not being a good person because that's my, that is my Achilles heel. And so in those moments, I'm naturally, I devastated, devastated because I'd never want that. That's just not the type of person um, that I am. That being said, I've had to learn also who I actually am in those moments when it's quite intense and there's a lot of opinions and a lot of, a lot of the time, a lot of stories that aren't, true that come out and you're just sort of like, oh God. Um, but it's such a hard one, isn't it? I'd say that I'm not about to feel sorry for myself about it. What I do is I understand the limitations of who I am as a person and I dust myself off and I just hope that I can do better in the future. That's genuinely how I want to approach every obstacle. Nothing is the end. And and I kind of hope as well that in the world that we're in, I always envisioned that I'd be like the sweetheart of the industry. That's definitely not me. <laughs> um, but what I hope that I can maybe be is that, because this happens to so many people, we, we make mistakes, we're human. And I hope that other people moving into this space, other creators, perhaps they can see that there is resilience in that as well. And just dusting yourself off, knowing, okay, that was that was a a tough one and getting better, doing better and showing that. That's what I really like to do is to just show that I'm a better person for it. And I, it has made me a better person. Every single one of those situations, I could, promise I've always come back and I'm like wow that has made me so much better I'm I, I like myself more for getting through it so yeah 
Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think you talk about that very well. And I think in a, I don't know, it's one of those things where we're kind of always just told avoid, avoid. And anytime I've had a type of situation, I've been like, I'm not a type of person to avoid. Like if my friend was upset about that, I'd just be like, so this is actually what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you Yours, know that see, like, but but it's, it's, it's tough. You can't, you can't explain. And I think as well, you, one thing you've done incredibly well is you through every single iteration, I, I saw you posting when you got to a million followers on TikTok and I saw you kind of be like- Sorry, did you just say a billion? I said a million. Oh, okay. Yes. I was just saying, I was saying a, a billion. Of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> a billion, yeah, a billion followers. Sorry, Kylie Jenner. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of saw when you were saying, it makes me feel great because it makes me feel like actually, it's not just like I'm one of those people who was in an industry and then just like happens to, you know, still be here. Yeah. Like I've kept evolving and you really, really have. And I think that's one of the things that's used against you, but is also one of the most impressive things about you. Mm. And I think that actually the way you talk about it is... I mean, I think it's great. It's very kind of you to say. You speak in the book on this kind of topic, or not necessarily on this topic, but about the ideal, but about the idea of failed projects. Mm. Um, and as someone who's living online, mm -hmm. you've obviously got to be failing online. Could you talk a little bit about your experience with, I guess, failed projects and failing online? I talk about it in the book. I do. I, I, I talk about it in, and this is, failure is something that I have only just got comfortable with. Like I, I, I had no idea how to fail because I'd never failed. Like I'd never experienced that at school. I, if I, if I didn't think I could achieve something, I didn't bother with it. If I could achieve it, I did my best at it. And so failing in the way that I did during the pandemic and I and launching my brand it was like I just didn't I didn't know how to cope with it at the time and it floored me and now I can see it as one of the best learnings of my entire existence but I wish I was more like you <laughs> in that you're really good at confronting things there and then. I think that that's, and, and I have to go away and I have to dissect things. I have to understand. I can't do anything without understanding it. I need to be able to rationalize something, understand every element of it before I can talk about it. And I think that, and I wish I could be that person that responds in the moment and says like the right thing, but I have to understand it first. And I had to grieve for that project it was because as, as much as it's been a few years I poured a lot into that I, just like anything I do I wanted it to be great and it wasn't and even being able to say that has been like even just to be able to say that I remember when my best friend was like you just said you failed for the first time and I was like what a day. Yeah, no. <laughs> literally I was like, oh. But I think that that was it, that it was, I had to go through the motions of grieving for something that I really thought was gonna be great because, you know, that was what we did. That was the, 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 the blueprint. You became an influencer, you did really well at it, you launched a brand and, and then you think you're Grace Beverly. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but genuinely I was like, I, I, I thought this was gonna, and I think that we, we're learning now that this isn't just, that isn't how it works. And actually, I didn't know enough. That's the long and short of it. I didn't know enough. And now I know more. And so hopefully I can take the lessons of, of that failure and wear them like a badge of honor because in the beginning it was a lot of shame, a lot of shame. And now it's like, it's, it's so fascinating to me to be able to turn something that I have never felt shame like that. And now it's like, yeah. Love that for me. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, yeah, I personally had a great time yeah. there. <laughs> and what did you learn from that experience? Um, oh, um, I learned that I am a creative and I very much need people to rein me in um, on that element. Um, I also learned a really, probably the most valuable lesson is about who you work with on things. And that I have 
taken with me into building my team now because the ride has to be with really good people and I think that I'd rather have a business that does all right and be surrounded by really epic people and say that we had a great time doing it than a business that's doing exponentially well and I'm surrounded by people that no one cares about each other, no one's, no one's interested in each other. I couldn't do that. I really love to be around people that I have a good time with all the time. And so that's what it, that was one of my biggest lessons. And so if you could do the whole thing again. I wouldn't do it. No, I'm joking, <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. I would, I would. <laughs> but even looking at your whole career, mm -hmm. if you were back to 18, you're considering your next steps. Mm -hmm. If you could do it all again, would you be an influencer? I think I confronted that very question even just recently where I genuinely for the first time I thought, am I gonna keep, keep doing this? I 110% would do it again. I would. And I think that the price we pay in this industry is because we had the perk of being in it early. And as with any industry in its in infancy, there are growing pains. There are areas where it doesn't work. It does work. We learn new things. I mean, we're still a completely pretty much unregulated industry to, a to there's no like governing body of influencers. We have it for the sponsored side of things, but not the, 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 the actual industry itself. And so of course we're still, we're still learning. Any person can become an influencer of anything at the moment. And so it's really early. And I would, I love the fact that I got to experience the early days because the early days were magic. Before the cultures that we see now, honestly, I'll never forget my first event that I went to. It was a Motel Rocks event. And we had a cardboard um, uh, cupcake tower. And I have never enjoyed myself like more. <laughs> And it was just amazing. Thank you to Motel Rocks, yeah. who is not sponsoring this no, no. podcast. <laughs> I'm actually wearing Motel Rocks. No, I'm not. It's very on brand, Lydia. Yeah. But it was, it, and do you know what I remember? Because um, I think Lily Pebbles was there and she was uh, working with, is it Birchbox at the time? And so she was like, you know, she was one of the very, very first wave. And I remember walking in and it was just like, it was the golden age of this industry where, we were in the early days, the sort of awkward girls that maybe girls and guys that, that, you know, I didn't really have a lot of friends at school, at uni. So I'd found myself online and there we were in our awkwardness at a Motel Rocks event. And it was great. With the cupcake tower. Yeah, the cupcake tower. <laughs> but it was, and it was, it was, um, what's the word? It was simple. Like it was just, it was lovely. And so I'm, I'm really happy that I experienced that side of the industry. It ha it's not an easy thing to go through when you're going through the growing p pains of any um, business or or industry in that way. I, d I do think that that it will grow and it will evolve and it, things will get better. But I wouldn't. I won't. I, I, I'm also not one of those people that's very talented. So I was always going to do something <laughs> like this. <laughs> Let's be honest. I hate it when people can like, I said this in my video not long ago, like when, when an influencer can all of a sudden like play the piano or sing. I'm <laughs> like, oh, you can play the piano, can't you? Oh God, you're not allowed to be talented. We're supposed to be talentless. <laughs> like this is, this is the only job <laughs> I could have done, Grace, okay? And there you are with your piano. <laughs> to be fair, I'm shit at the piano now. Yeah, no, it's got, it's got really down there. <laughs> but genuinely, I think that that's the thing. I, I like, I, I've really enjoyed the ride the ups, the downs, and you've got to have the downs to experience the And right. I've had some highs, like some incredible highs. I've been, I'm gonna blow my own trumpet here, but like I have, I've, I've worked with some of the biggest brands in the world in my career. And like, I would never have ever had that opportunity. I tried to be a model, it didn't work. So I, I did this and I, and it worked-ish. And so I've, I've had some amazing opportunities and I wouldn't change it for anything. I wouldn't. Well, I think that's the perfect place to end. Um, thank you for being so honest and open. Really? My yeah. palms are really sweaty. <laughs> like, I'm literally <laughs> dripping yeah, yeah. sweat. No, you've been fantastic. And I honestly think that it's, it's really clear who you are. And I think that's really important in the midst of everything. Mm. Um, I think that's easy to forget. And I think, um, 
I mean, it's clear you're a lovely person who means really well. And I think that's oh, really Achilles all we can ask smiling for. smiling right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, I've, I've had, now that I'm starting to stop sweating, I've, I've had a really great time. <laughs>